Well, thank you all for coming. Um, thanks for the mornings for inviting me to speak, and uh, thank you for coffee too this morning. Um, I own my own shop, so we usually start at 11. This is a little early for me. But, uh, <laughs> coffee and nerves is getting me through. So close your eyes and imagine yourself on a 70-foot, two-masted schooner cruising the bay with all its sails flying. The westerly breeze is blowing a strong, constant 20 knots, and the frosty spray from the rolling chop is blowing over the deck. Three bigger boats are closing in on your lead as the captain calls for attack around the race marker. This is where I found myself on a day in May of 2013. I was a deckhand on the schooner Gaslight, which was captained by a zealous man who would do anything to win the Master Mariner's regatta, including almost killing me. It was a day that changed my life. As we rounded up on that marker, I was standing on the bowsprit. My job was to pass the sail of the flying jib between two stays so it could be flown to the other side as we changed course. At the moment, a gust of wind came over the edge of Angel Island and whipped the sail like a kite stuck in a hurricane. My hand instinctively caught a line to catch hold of it before the massive sail sunk below the water, but the rope tore under my palm towards the block. Luckily, the gust changed direction and the sail somehow regained its original course through the stays. My hand was saved. I watched our rival, free to be, scream by only a few feet from our starboard side and the crew taunting us as they did, gaining that lead that we never managed to get back. As I tied the boat up to the dock in Sausalito after the race, I counted each one of my fingers and realized they were all there. And even though I knew it was an act of God, the captain's risky choice to fly the sail in that window was cost me my hand. He should have known better. He should have known better about berating me about losing that race. So after some words I don't regret, I quit on the spot and quickly gathered myself to crawl sobbing wet back to the old fishing boat I was living on was now jobless. But as I climbed aboard that trawler, my phone buzzed, and it was an email from Heath Ceramics. Roughly a year later, I found myself sweeping the sidewalk with a coffee in my hand of my own, very own print shop, saying good morning to neighbors as they walked past. And this was my dream since college. And as I stood there in the warm sun, I remember that cold day on the boat. Some people call this luck, some skill, others privilege. My astrologist said it was that my Saturn returned. <laughs> but I think it was a little bit of all that. And I searched deep inside, I know it was my determination to find myself on, to not find myself on my deathbed, regretting a wasted life that I've seen so many other people have. Like was mentioned, I was born in New Jersey on June 12, 1984. And eight days before Bruce Springsteen released Born in the USA, which seemed to encapsulate my upbringing. My father was a butcher and my mom was a manicurist, and they, were, they raised me in a rundown lower class city on the Jersey Shore called Long Branch. I spent the time, uh, I spent the time between collecting seashells at my parents' house, which was across the street from the boardwalk, as you can see there, and my grandparents' Christmas tree farm at Home Dome which was a more compelling version of New Jersey, as it is today. It was surrounded by horse farms and creeks at the time, which me and my brother explored for miles, not coming home till sunset. My love for drawing grew from playing with pens and markers laying around that tree barn, you see there. Drawing old tractors that, used to, that were used around the farm, and my grandfather's tails and deep sea fishing for tunas and sharks off the coast. He worked as a longshoreman up in Elizabeth, which is up north. While well, my grandmother tended to the trees, that's her there, and the business of the farm. She was my compass in life. While my parents were abrasive and often abusive to my brother and I, my grandmother taught, taught us kindness, to respect the land, and to have fun. Her community of friends from all walks of life were her most treasured possessions. She was one of the only ones who encouraged me to keep drawing throughout my childhood. I attended Catholic school for most of my life in second grade, and in second grade they took away our arts and music classes for some reason. We never got it back. This is when things got hard for me. I didn't learn that way. My grades suffered. Abuse became more common in school at home. So I survived through an imagination of taking me out of the prison I was living in. People who cared about my brother and I would sometimes confront my parents, but no one would confront the school, so nothing changed. 
You know, the human mind can endure tremendous amounts of pain. I know this firsthand. And I'm still left with the scars of this time. Even those, those wounds have healed over. It's taken years for me to dismantle the armor surrounding me. High school was kind of a time for exploration for me. There's no high school photos of me. <laughs> <laughs> a public high school in a blue collar city has the advantage of mixing a lot of different types of people together. Drugs, music, and art were my main interests. And when I was not thinking, I was not thinking about the future until I received a letter saying I was going to fail out of school. The only solution for me was go to a vocational school. This was offered to last year kids that had failed out of high school. And diesel mechanics and plumbing were the typical offers. But there was one unusual program offered, graphic design. Now I remember one of the kindest people uh, I knew growing up with my, was my mother's friend Julie. She was a graphic designer and drove the nicest car I've ever been in. <laughs> she took me to ballet, and croissants, and she had a car phone. She was really fancy. <laughs> So I wanted to be a graphic designer for sure, not a plumber. <laughs> Luckily, I had a great experience in vocational school. The education was set up to work with visual um, thinking minds like mine. It was challenging, but I pulled through and graduated at the top of my class. And with the skills and portfolios under my belt, I decided to apply for colleges. And surprising to myself, I got into them, and um, my parents were happy, which was good for a change. That's a stock photo. The warm foot of the her white sands of Florida <laughs> seemed pretty good at the time. So I packed my bags and headed to Sarasota. But after two years of Raylan College of Art and Design, I decided that graphic design was not for me. I felt trapped behind those computers and frosty labs playing with digital fonts. I found myself gravitating towards the sculpture and printmaking studios. I think it might have been one of those professors bringing me an exhibition of hand show print when I first looked about letterpress. I fell in love with the look of distress type, desaturated colors, and half-tone photos. I knew I wanted to do letterpress, but unfortunately, Ringling didn't have a letterpress studio at the time, so I started looking for colleges that did. I spent the summer in Nashville, in between uh, Ringling, uh, at an internship at the historic letterpress shop at Showprint, learning from, one, from, from some of the greatest letterpress press printers that were still alive. I even got to make posters uh, for heroes of mine. Maryland Institute College of Art was a tough school. I fell in love with the brick and the history. I fell in love with the print studio and the community surrounding it. I absorbed everything I could. And since I knew my future would incorporate the two of graphic design and letterpress, I balanced my studies with both those classes. It felt like my brain opened up. I could swallow the whole city, and I still wanted more. The city of Baltimore is an amazingly depressing and inspiring place. <laughs> if you've seen the water, you know. The swaths of the city are abandoned, historic row houses, other architectural gems beautifully maintained, that houses schools and museums. Streetcar lines lay half, laid unused, half paved over. And the neighborhoods recall a time where corner shops were the hub of the community. This struck me deeply. The bygone charm and the service of the neighborhood cobbler, pharmacist, watchmaker, and printer. I knew what I eventually wanted. I wanted that hub, that component, something a community could count on. And print was my means to that end. The 1970s letterpress printing was nearing the end of its 500 year old life. New advances of offset lithography made press, presses cheaper and faster than that of letterpress. These older presses were either scrapped for their value, uh, for their metal, or sold to developing countries. Luckily, a few artists recognized the value of the craft and started amassing collections on the cheap. In the mid 2000s, there were just two places in the country that were the last bastion to the business of letterpress New York City and San Francisco. So with the promise of better, better weather and a better quality of life, I packed my grandfather's old army duffel bag and headed out west, knowing only one person and praying she had a couch I could sleep on. Luckily she did, and took me about a month to find a steady job in an apartment. The book bindery where I found work was one of the last in the city that made books by hand. 
I did everything from one of a kind to small runs of self-published books to rebinding old family Bibles. It was valuable in the sense that it taught me how to work efficiently in production, but also how not to treat my employees. <laughs> so I needed a release and escape from the trappings of the glue machines and my hard-ass manager breathing down my neck. Now, if you can't tell from my slides and such, I love history. One of my favorite things to do is wander around old San Francisco and learn about the city I live in. One of those days I came across the Maritime Museum on High Street here. I had a big banner that said volunteer and learn how to sail. So it sounded like a dream not paying job to me. So I signed up. I dedicated a lot of time there and eventually after they determined I was on some inept person walking off the street, I learned how to sail, I taught kids how to sail, and I maintained wood boats. Volunteering was a wonderful opportunity and provided a community that I quickly thought of as family. So after two years of bookbinding, I got a lead at a full-time letterpress shop at a wedding invitation and greeting workshop in Soma. At Hello Lucky, I was given the chance to hone my printing skills on presses. I only read it out in school. A few years, and I eventually developed my own business after hours, using their presses. This is where the aesthetic union was born. I started meeting people in need of print, and I did it for the cheap to get my name out there. I posted photos on Tumblr and then a new app called Instagram. I think it was, it was new for me. Printing for friends eventually led designers to take notice, which again then led to more jobs. My business name, the Aesthetic Union, rang true. It was a collaboration of the aesthetics of design and craft to make something greater than what was on screen. And importantly, people were understanding it. So having a steady job allowed me not only to create a business, but to fulfill a childhood fantasy. In January of 2012, I bought a 35-foot Monterey trawler, a fishing boat that was built in 1926, with the intent of living aboard. <laughs> <laughs> not only was I reliving one of those stories that I held dear that my grandfather told me about, those old fishing boats and captains, but I also found a way, of avoid, a, a way to avoid pain not paying San Francisco, high rent. I felt like I had enough experience with wooden boats uh, at the museum, but it's slightly different when you own the boat. <laughs> so things were going well, and I had a full-time creative job, a side business that was getting a lot of attention, and I was living aboard my dream boat, and to top it all off, I was saving a lot of money. Well, of course, this is when it all comes crashing down. It's also when I was 29, so Saturday returns maybe. <laughs> the month after moving aboard the boat, I was laid off at Hello Lucky. I was a bit dazed after spending more than four years of my life at one job, being surrounded by the people I loved to work with. It was all gone within the moment. Not only, not only that, but I also found out marinas don't like people living on their boats without their permission, so I was immediately kicked out of the harbor I was living in. After a few nights on anchor, I eventually found a slip to the dock uh, for my boat at a houseboat commune in Sausalito. It still exists. And the vibe was pretty crunchy, which is not really my style. <laughs> so I found a loophole in the Port of San Francisco's laws about fishing boats and liveaboards and moved, the moved to the commercial docks at Christian's Wharf. The vibe was much more salty, more my style. <laughs> When I wasn't battling sea lions trying to launch themselves over the gunnels to sunbathe on my deck, I was working part-time at the Maritime Museum as a deckhand and racing big boats. I felt like it was an old-time San Francisco family, making art and drinking and rock with North, North Beach poets late, to, late into the morning. Those three years on the water hold too many stories to count, but I can safely say I met some genuine human beings. The one thing they all had going for them they were living their true selves, unfazed by the ultra-capitalistic, ego-driven city San Francisco had become. It was basic survival at its finest and its worst. Semi-retired living on my boat would be many people's dreams, but something didn't sit right with me. My aspirations of making art for a living and creating a community around that were not met. Your path might have many enticing distractions, and this was exactly that for me. I know I needed to pursue my path. This was all felt reminiscent of being stuck in that rundown town in New Jersey. 
watching all those people that would never leave. I had to get out of this dream. But how? Due to the connections I made developing the aesthetic union, heat ceramics started construction on a tile factory in San Francisco in 2012. Actually, two blocks down from the book library where I worked. Their plan was to ask small manufacturing businesses to occupy the storefronts on one side of the massive building. Uh, no one by me. No one uh, bought that except me. They contacted me through a number of people whom I did work with after hours at LLE. I was hesitant at first, but after convincing a friend of mine to split the rent, I was all in. Well, I thought buying a half rotten boat and living on it uh, on the bay was a scary thing, but opening a shop with all the money I saved up to that point in my life was much more terrifying. Investing in yourself is never a bad idea, as long as you can sacrifice almost everything to get where you want to go. Unfortunately, I sacrificed too much. Close relationships and caring for myself became second to getting my dream off the ground. I can't recommend this, but it got the job done. It's been six years now, and much has changed since the beginning. We now have a full-time printer and a project manager and a robust collaborative retail space and a gallery in the front of the shop. We've worked with hundreds of clients doing custom letterpress jobs um, and design. And I've had the time to continue my art practice by creating limited edition block prints. I really wish I could say it was smooth sailing after we opened our doors in December of 2013. But like with everything, there's so much to learn, and you only can learn by doing those things. So what can I impart to you after all this? Well, I can tell you about working uh, as a creative under pressure, or maybe how to operate a small business on a small budget. But there's been a lot written about those things. They can say those things way better than I can. I'd rather tell you about the reasons why I go to work every day, why I took the long, hard road to get there, and why I pushed through those days where I can't think I can do it anymore. I think each one of us can use those lessons, whether you're creating a business or not. It's just good for being human beings. Get out your notebooks. Lesson number one, you have enough. Have some goals, not fantasies. If you have fantasies, they'll never come true. So have attainable goals and work towards them. These goals should always grow and move with you. To be mindful every day. A fresh mind that is stepped 10 feet away, a fresh mind that is stepped 10 feet away from an object can see more than a pair of eyes 10 inches from it. Out there. <laughs> but, uh, more often than not, I catch myself walking into my print shop and thinking to myself, this is incredible. Uh, this, is, this is incredible right here. But sometimes I stand at my desk and wonder, how can I get myself out of this place, believe it or not? <laughs> Nothing has changed on the surface. Material, everything is the same, the same potential. But what has changed is my mindset. Number three, stop and listen to yourself. Don't listen to the person who you think you are. Listen to the person who you truly are. That kid inside. It's going to take a lot of work. It took a lot of work for me. But it'll become second nature after that. And it'll be your compass for creativity in life. Number four is to build a community. Without the community, who are we? Communities improve quality of life for all people by creating a social sounding board, a safe space to be your true selves, and a safe net for those in need. And number five, don't become attached. Some of the wisest words I heard about business was think of the money. Think of money as tides. They come and go out. The larger the flood, the greater the ebb. We can only pray for an even tide, but it's out of our hands for the most part. So some things change for the good, some for the worse. But if you can accept this, it'll be a lot easier to let go of those things and be present in the moment to figure out how to change those to be good again. So how does this end? Rather, how will the aesthetic union cease to be? The end of the company is something we don't hear a lot in talks. 
but I think it needs to be part of the conversation. I've asked myself this question hundreds and hundreds of times, just like you and I and everyone we know. Well then, this inevitable conclusion is somewhere in the future, but hopefully far, far away. I don't think it's wise for any business to think it'll live forever. So my final words of advice is, think about dying a good death. How can you leave your business and be happy about it? What is your end goal? Did you waste your time? Or did you accomplish what you set out to do? What will it feel like to close those doors for the very last time? At this point, I'm still wondering that myself. But at least I know I'll have some stories to tell. Thank you.